You're listening to the Bible teaching ministry of Pastor Ross Graham of Grace Bible Church, Kingswood, New South Wales, Australia. Ross will be using the inerrant Word of God to draw our truths in its original context. To find more messages like this, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org or to join our online community, you can now find us on Facebook by searching for Grace Bible Church Kingswood. May this message today bless you and as always, bring glory to God. Here's Pastor Ross. Well, good morning and welcome to our service this morning in whichever mode you're joining us. May the Lord bless you and uh, may uh, the day unfold to his glory. We want you to enjoy our time of worship, whether you're here or in home, so please enjoy. Have you turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, the passage that was <coughs> read just a little while ago in the service. Uh, keep it open at that spot. We'll get there in a few moments' time as we start to wind down this series that we have been involved in over the past few weeks. Uh, back to our roots. Next Sunday morning, I am going to begin a series in the book of the Revelation. Those of you who uh, are interested in prophetic things, uh, should be here, and uh, it'll be an exciting time. 
be a challenge for me to try to make it very simple for you to understand and that's what I intend to do and uh, maybe take a different approach as well. But uh, let me just begin this time in the precious word of God today by saying simply this, that one far side cartoon by Gary Larson, and he has a lot of things down there in the National Library at uh, Canberra, one Far Side cartoon by Gary uh, shows a group of cowboys around a campfire at night. And all eyes stare at uh, one cow hand as another announces, Hey, everyone, Simmons here has just uttered a discouraging word. And if you and I could add a final additional frame, we'd probably see Simmons lying flat on his back, boots in the air, with a single wisp of smoke rising from his chest. Because whether we are at home on the range or working in an office, none of us like to meet discourages. And none of us like to meet discourages because rather than offering solutions, these naysayers uh, shovel out all of the reasons why something won't work in all the world, how something or someone did some, something uh, wrong and did it badly, or why everybody's wrong but them. And emotionally what happens is these people tend to add weight to your load and toss a wet bl blanket over your feelings of joy. Now we might expect such grumblings from disgruntled colleagues at work or our disgruntled neighbours down the street, but what can we do when these critics sit beside you in church? What can we do when those people sit beside you in church, worshipping the same God as you, bringing discouraging words with them? Well, we can find a, a biblical solution by examining the pages of Scripture where we find a command by the Lord himself to encourage one another. And we'll discuss biblical encouragement in a few moments' time, but first let me explore the opposite of encouragement, which is discouragement. The Oxford Dictionary defines the word discourage as follows. To deprive of courage or confidence. To dishearten to hinder by disfavouring, to attempt to dissuade, to cause someone to lose confidence or enthusiasm. And I'm sure in the outliving of your life, uh, over the years that you have uh, lived upon this earth, I'm sure that most of you have experienced someone like that in your life at least one time. And the truth of the matter is we've all felt the pain of discouragement, haven't we? We've all felt the sting of discouraging words, whether in our relationships, in our families, or our homes, or whatever the case may be, in our marriage relationships, words of discouragement. And rather than being discouragers, I want to suggest to you that we ought to be encouragers. I want to suggest to you that that is what God really desires in the life of a blood-purchased child of the living God to be an encourager. And we want to be people with positive attitudes who bring joy to others and who help them reach their full potential in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that God wanted them to be. We've all been touched by friends and family members who have encouraged us by believing in us and seeing the best in us. And these people have, a, have been powerful motivating forces in our lives. If you sit back and assess, they've been powerful motivating forces in, in our lives. And we want to be the same for them, as well as for each person with whom we interact each day. The dictionary defines... Uh, encourages us this way, to inspire with hope, courage and confidence, hearten, to give support to, to foster, to stimulate, to spur one another on. 
And I think it's very, very true to say that we all know someone like that and that their encouragement has been important in your life. They have come alive. They have come beside you and they've put their arm on your shoulder and they've encouraged you. And undoubtedly, we all need frequent, uh, frequent refreshing drinks from the spring of encouragement because without uplifting words from others, especially from others in the body of Christ, we can become discouraged and we can feel like quitting. We can feel like throwing in the towel. So it makes sense that the Lord would command us to encourage one another. I mean, if we can't find encouragement among fellow Christians, then where else on the earth can we look? If you can't come to a place like this and find encouragement one with another, where else will you find it? Now, I've turned you to Hebrews chapter 10. And the book of Hebrews is uh, intended to help us see Jesus Christ as he really is. You see, Jesus is the God-man. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. And as the God-man, he ranks superior in every way to all of the Old Testament priests, all of the Old Testament prophets, all of the Old Testament sacrifices, and he fulfills the reality of God's promises. While all the others served merely as shadows or types of the Messiah who was to come. And we read in the 19th verse of chapter 10, if you would follow along in your copy of God's inerrant word, we read this. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. He's writing to believers. In verses 19 through 21 of the passage, the author reminds us that we enjoy a relationship with God the Father in which we can enter into his very presence. And Christ has made this fellowship possible by bridging the gap between us and God, by becoming our final priest, our final sacrifice, by going to the cross of Calvary as a substitute where Jesus, where God laid upon Jesus the sins of us all, where he was, where he was crucified, where he died, and where he was buried on the third day and, ro uh, th uh, and rose rather on the third day. Hallelujah. We have glory in Christ. And stemming from this wonderful privilege we have in Christ, the author then issues three commands in three verses. And each command is introduced by the words, let us. Follow along verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds. The words spur one another in verse 24 come from the Greek word parazousmos and has with it the idea of 
strong motivation or provoking or spurring on to love and good deeds. And the word suggests that we should consider how to encourage life change in others. Producing in them a, a dissatisfaction with anything less than practical godliness. So, entering God's holy presence, persevering in solid doctrine, and encouraging one another to love and good deeds are not three separate majors in the college of Christianity. No, 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 not at all. You see, each command ultimately finds its obedience in the balance of all of the others. You see, the question is, can we exclusively devote ourselves to entering God's presence apart from true doctrine? Or can we devote ourselves to doctrine apart from God or people? Let me remind you, right doctrine, right living. Garbage in, garbage out. Right doctrine, right living. And the author of Hebrews continues in verse 25 by explaining how we can spur one another on to love and good deeds. And we read in verse 25 these words. <clears throat> Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now there's a word. Let us not give up meeting together. Encourage one another. You see, this command has been issued to every Christian, not just a few. And I don't know whether you've seen it before, and I don't know whether you've ever realized it before, but listen to me, church. We can't spur or stimulate others on to love and good deeds if we're not around them. We can't be an encouragement if we live our lives like hermits, hiding in caves, pushing people away from us, and too worried to get involved and be vulnerable in relationships. People who are out of touch with reality won't be well equipped, let me tell you, to encourage others, because encouragement is a face-to-face -face endeavor, especially in the church, the body of Christ. It's easy for us as Christians to become attracted to theological study to the exclusion of building close relationships with each other. But we need both. There ain't no lone rangers in the church, the body of Christ. You see, the church, a place that provides strong spiritual instruction, should also be a place that offers deep fellowship and personal compassion. And I say that to you because the truth of the matter is the same scriptures that encourage us to grow in knowledge also exhort us to grow in love and in grace and acceptance of others. The passages that urge clear thinking and wise discernment are well balanced by other passages in the precious and errant word of God that affirm our call to understand and encourage one another in the church, the body of Christ. Now, because our words are our primary means of offering encouragement to others, let's allow God's word to have its way with that little instrument that produces words. The mucous membrane that sits in your mouth, the tongue. 
And I'm here to tell you that the Bible has much to say about the power of the tongue. For instance, if you go to Proverbs 10, 21, whip over to the Old Testament passage, find the book of Psalms round about the middle of your Bibles, and then the next book after the book of Psalms is the book of Proverbs, written under the inspiration of God by King Solomon, and there's much wisdom in the book of Psalms, but find Proverbs chapter 10, verse 21. In Proverbs 10.21, we read this. The lips of the righteous nourish or encourage many, but fools die for lack of judgment. In uh, Proverbs 12.18, the scripture says, Reckless words pierce like a sword but the tongue of the wise brings healing reckless words pierce like a sword but the tongue of the wise bring healing and can you remember a time when you felt depressed hurting and hopeless someone came along and spoke to you the very words of life or maybe here this morning you remember uh, being hurt so deeply that your emotional wound took a long time to heal. And just about the time it started to heal, someone opened up the wound again. Well, hopefully in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your suffering and your sorrow and emotional fog that you were in, someone in God's family cared enough to look you straight in the eye and speak words of grace and comfort to you, saying just the right thing at just the right time. You see, the tongue of the wise brings healing. Those are the kinds of words we want to have as believers in Christ. Words that encourage and heal. Words that build us up. And someone once said, I can live for two months on a good compliment. But before we let our tongues out of the house, let's deal with them there in our homes. You see, if walls could talk, they would reveal that when we're at home, our words and our actions expose our true colors. When someone says to me, he is a good man, I always turn to his wife and say, what's he like in the house? That tells the story. Our words bring either life or death to those we love. And I want you to consider the words of Proverbs 18.21 in the context of your own family. Listen to what this, the, the Proverbs 18.21 says. The tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. One father told his son who had just graduated from university with a music degree. So what are you going to do now? Get a job and mow lawns. In other words, your degree is worthless. And the son took to heart the painful message. You're worthless. And he lived his life in depression and discouragement for the rest of his days. Death is in the power, listen to me, 
Death is in the power of the tongue. Now wait, 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 wait. <laughs> so is life. So is life. Consider the true example of Benjamin West, who loved to paint as a youngster. And one day he painted a picture, uh, but he splattered oil paint everywhere, making a huge mess. And he tried to clean it up before his mum came home, but she walked in and she saw it all everywhere, all over the place. And she walked over to the painting, looked at it, and she said, My, what a beautiful painting of your sister. Then she kissed his cheek and left. West later said that with that kiss he became a painter. He painted famous historical scenes such as the death of Nelson and the Treaty of Paris and many others. Church, our words of encouragement will not be overlooked easily or erased. And even today, as you sit in this little church, each of us can remember life-changing words spoken to us by a parent, by a teacher, by a co coach, or a pastor, or a friend. Words have power. They have power for death or for life. And the truth is that we can't change yesterday, but just think about the possibilities that await us tomorrow. It's never too late to, for us to start doing what is right. Let your words, listen to me, let your words put skin on Scripture and start encouraging one another even more as the day approaches. And ideally, we should try to speak words of life to every single solitary person that we meet. I'm convinced of that. But let your comments to encourage begin at home. And then expand outward and include all the people within your sphere of refer reference. Make a commitment today to genuinely encourage each person you meet, including those under your roof. And then watch and see how encouraging words from your tongue can bring life. You know, church, the Bible abounds with examples of encouragers. Did you know that? Men like Cable, uh, Caleb, women like Ruth, Nehemiah was another one, and then Barnabas, whose very name means son of encouragement. And of course, uh, the Lord Jesus himself, they all spoke words of life to those who needed to hear them. David's life offers one of the finest examples of words that healed during a time of discouraging, discouragement, during a discouraging time in his life. Remember the immediate fame he achieved after killing the nine foot six giant by the name of Goliath? Remember that? David went from a nobody to becoming a national hero overnight. And the people sang his praises. They sang his praises. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And everybody sang along except for one person, except for King Saul. Everybody applauded except the one who wanted all the applause for himself. And Saul's jealousy and fits of rage forced David to live on the run as a fugitive for 12 years. 
And the Psalms record some of David's most heart-wrenching cries to God during those years of fear and dependence. And ironically, ironically, Saul's son, Jonathan, of all people, developed a close relationship with David. And they loved each other as the best of friends, according to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 18 and following. And once when a desperate David lay hidden in the wilderness, perhaps quivering in a cave, Jonathan offered these healing words, and they're found in 1 Samuel 23, 16 through 17. Just, let me just read them for you. And Saul's son Jonathan went to David. He went to David at Horesh. And helped him find strength in God. Helped him find strength in the Lord. Don't be afraid, David. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel. And Jonathan's purpose was to encourage David. And he encouraged him to find strength in God. To find strength in the Lord. And when we get discouraged, you and I as blood-purchased children of the living God, we need to remember that God has promised never to leave us, nor to forsake us, and that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Nothing. Death can't, life can't, demons can't, all of creation can't. Nothing in all of creation will ever separate you from the love of God in Christ. Hallelujah. Nothing. But a word of warning. As someone once said, the same man cannot be both friend and flatterer. As we encourage others, we must carefully differentiate between encouragement and flattery. Because even if we speak accurately, we're still guilty of flattery if self-interest motivates our words. Ultimately, listen to me carefully, Ultimately honeyed words spoken with ulterior motives cause only harm in the end. Proverbs uh, 29.5 reminds us, whoever flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his feet. Now listen carefully. A true biblical encouragement will flow naturally. Will flow naturally from a heart that has experienced the love and the peace and the joy and the grace of Christ. So rather than resorting to vague pleasantries, empty comment, compliments and false flattery, seek to provide real encouragement to those who are around you today, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ. An uplifting phone call. A thoughtful card. A small gift. And even a few kind words can, can mean so much to a person who is in need of encouragement. In fact, the words you speak today may have an eternal effect on the life of someone else. So let me encourage you to start encouraging. Start encouraging. Amen, amen. and amen. For those of you at home, there'll be a beautiful song up on your screen to follow along to. God 
holds my hand in every situation When hardships come, he's there to see me through He's there to guide me when I'm in the valley With hope that there's a mountaintop in you God is with me on this journey Step along the way My enemies may gather all around me Oh, but the love of God is stronger than my foes Though doubts may try to undermine my future I'm holding to the promise that Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the, the service, for all who have been involved. We thank you, Father, for the encouragement that we find in the Word of God. And we thank you for the command that you have given us uh, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but, Father, encourage one another. I pray today that as we leave this place that we would determine in the week ahead and the month ahead and perhaps even to the balance of the year that we would, as believers in Christ, that we would take the opportunity to draw alongside someone, someone who is perhaps uh, sinking a little under the weight of the pressures that they face and just encourage them, share with them a word, a note, a gift, a prayer. Oh Lord, I pray that you would do that for, for each and every one in this place today and that you would get the praise and the honour and the glory, for we ask it in the strong and precious name of Jesus as we ask you to dismiss us with your wonderful grace. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to Pastor Ross Graham. And for more information about his ministry, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org Until next time, God bless.